Okay, so I think that Tom has done a really good job setting the scene. I like it. He touched on so many topics. And at the same time, I'm thinking, oh, he's talking about the things that I'm going to cover. But that means, actually, I can get through uh, some of my slides faster because you already know about that. So address planning. Besides training your staff, which is one of the first things that you need to think about if they haven't already been trained, it's um, for your deployment or even be the pilot, you need to allocate or assign some addresses, right? So how do you go about it? So in this talk, which actually 30 minutes isn't that much, I used to do a Cisco Life presentations where it was 90 minutes and included an exercise for an audience of over 300 people. So there was actually quite in depth, um, um, quite in-depth session. So in this one, I would like to cover the main points. And really, when it comes to address planning, how do you know what size of IPv6 assignment you need? How do you go about obtaining IPv6 prefix? And thirdly, how do you create an IPv6 addressing plan? And at the end, I would like to touch on a few things which uh, are not really direct about the addressing plan, but there are some things that you need to keep in mind. And uh, we will also get to the EULA point, absolutely. So let's get started. Uh, how do you go about gathering your requirements? So this is something that we in general really don't like, you know, people, you know, doing kind of an audit, you know, kind of putting the information together because it's tedious, you have to talk with people. You basically kind of need to do a bit of a cleanup. And I would say when you are preparing for your IPv6 project, it's an opportunity. So look where in you, because you are not usually coming to a completely new environment, Greenfield, you are going into Brownfield environment. Um, obviously, it's a different thing for newcomers into the market who need to do IPv6 immediately from the start. But basically, the suggested process is you are going to get a prefix of a certain size, or you're going to request a prefix of certain size. So the good way to go about it is like thinking, where are you going to be deploying where you are physically based, right? Are you within a region of a country, or you are in different places over a country, or maybe you've got multinational presence over a continent, or you are present globally across multiple regional internet registry uh, regions, right? So the thing that Tom was already touching on, the thing when you are preparing your request, you are not concerned about how many hosts you can have on a single subnet, because the subnet is slash 64, and yes, there are different ways how to work with them. Somebody says slash 64 per device in some use cases, but in most cases, it's a subnet where your endpoints, your end users are connected. So you can connect quite a few devices there. So that really doesn't matter. The question is, if you are operating globally over multiple regions, are you going to need uh, allocation from different regional internet registries, right? Then the other way to go about it when you think, yes, we want to deploy, and ultimately you should always say we are going to deploy everywhere, even though you might be starting on a, in a particular location, because from the start you need to think of the whole thing of the deployment. You're not going to eat the elephant in one go, you eat it a bit by bit, but basically you need to have this kind of big thinking hat on your head. And then the next step which usually works for many people is to think about the network segments being the different types of network that you are supporting where your users, your devices uh, live. What about your cloud connectivity? Are you going to split the prefix by a business unit because for some companies that works that way or for university it might be by departments etc. Right? So there are so many different ways how you can think about how you're going to create the next level of hierarchy. Um, also, the good thing to think about is what is the maximum within a level, you know? So for example, you can have a campus where you have 10, 20 buildings and you then have a single outlier somewhere in the middle of nowhere for a research that needs connecting. So you need to find kind of the, the level which is going to accommodate your, your largest um, number within that. Also your services, where do they live? They might be on-prem, they might be distributed into branches, but nowadays everybody is putting lots of services into the cloud. And when you think about it, there are so many components that live in data centers, be it it's not just the servers or the number of containers you can run on a server. It's not just about the number of topograph, topograph switches or 
think about your PDUs, your air conditioning, physical security, all those things, it really doesn't matter. It's a slash 64 for a single segment where all those devices are connected. Important thing is to think more in terms of location and where are you going to break out onto the internet. Your network segments probably already exist. You might have some part of your data center which is serving your corporate network, some which is providing some level of um, services to your guest access. It might be your controllers for your guest Wi-Fi place there, etc. right? The good thing is if your architecture, your, your segmentation is good, is to follow it. If it can do with some improving, it's probably time to do some changes, you know, because you will just bundle them together with the IPv6 deployment. When it comes to security, the security teams usually have very strong say when it comes to IPv6 deployment because they need to be sure that they are not blind to the IPv6 traffic. They're still able to protect at any level of the network uh, and from the user experience. They might want to have some uh, requests how you split the prefixes or how you build the levels because they want to have easily manageable access lists. Of course, talking about the capabilities in the hardware, you know, that's another thing. But in the conceptual thinking, you need to keep that in mind. Also, do you want to expose information about your network in your addressing? Because if somebody would get access and they would be able to map it out, they might actually see what is, what is sitting where. Um, you kind of need to keep it simple. Don't overdo it with that. And then uh, Tom mentioned the mergers and acquisitions. Again, how often does your organization, if it does, acquire another company? A large international as they do, that's how usually they grow their business, how they grow their portfolio. Uh, connecting on RFC 1918 is a true pain, and the answer is IPv6 would help here. The problem is if the uh, target systems are not V6 enabled. But keep that in mind that that's something that can alleviate the problem. But you can actually get significant portion of address space that um, doesn't matter who you acquire. Um, and also who you acquire, they will have, if they have IPv6, they will have their own unique. You know, there isn't going to be any overlap. So we know how we can put the requirements together. You then need to go. Oh, actually, I forgot to say. This is I don't need to cover because um, Tom has already explained it. Um, as he said, all the link local are super important. Make sure you don't block them out in your access lists because then you kill the on-link communication. Um, anyway, so I don't need to talk about this any further. I wanted to just refresh everybody. So where you go to get an IPv6 prefix? So you are getting the global unicast address. That's what you are getting, right? And you either go to your local internet registry, it will be your upstream provider, and you can then uh, usually get a provider assigned prefix. But not everybody likes it in case you're going to change your ISP as a potential of that, and then you would have to readdress. So then you can go directly to RIPE. So, and you can be either sponsored by your LIR, you work with them, or you can go and become an LIR, the local internet registry member of RIPE. And uh, this is actually really typical for ISPs or any like, um, in, it's not just internet connection, but people that provide services in cloud, large enterprises that span multiple countries, they go directly to uh, RIPE, for example, here in Europe. And there you have links to the address allocation and assignment policy. It's, it's not too long, but it's very interesting to read. And the minimum assignment that you're going to get is slash 48. There is, again, some requirement that you need to meet. But nowadays, this is not really um, that useful because just the universal, everybody's just going to get slash 48. If you think about it, there's only slash 16 between the 48 and 64. So there might be a good reason to get a larger prefix. For that, you usually need to provide some appropriate documentation. And because you have already got it, your requirements, you know what you're going to do. You already have the documentation, so it's very easy to submit. And typically, there the uh, uh, assignment would be slash 32. For good, it's good to know that you, it's assigned from slash 29 uh, in case you go back and you need more space. Obviously, you would have to justify that. But you will have already reserved in the RRI system slash 29, so there is some continuity. The typical practice for companies that operate across multiple regions is to have prefixes from different uh, RIRs. I worked for a large corporate um, company, and we had a prefix from Arin, from RIPE, and from APNIC. Even though the original, the first IPv6 deployment started with the prefixes from Arin only, 
because it wasn't that big um, by the time they actually got properly going and wanted to deploy to end user segments, then they were able to uh, address those with the new prefixes from RIPE and APNIC. And I tell you what, you may say, oh, it's a waste. From operations perspective, it's fantastic. As an engineer, you just look at the prefix and you know what you're working with. You are like if something has a problem, you look at the rounding table or whatever. You just know which part of the world you are looking at. And also, you think, oh, I'm not, never going to remember it. Like you remember the good times before the smartphones where we had to remember our, the phone numbers? We, our brains can still do it. You know, you will remember it, especially if you're just getting few slash 32s. But if you don't want to do that, there is no policy which would um, you know, prohibit out-of-region announcements. You just need to work with your upstream ISP. Also bear in mind right now, the longest uh, announcements that you can have is slash 48. So, and that's done to keep the global IPv6 routing table uh, relatively small. If you look already, I think it's over, over 180,000 IPv6 prefixes advertised globally, you know, think about the times when we had less than half a million IPv4 subnets in a global routing table. That's a few years ago, but, uh, you know, so we want to keep, in, and in general also the RIRs, they want to keep the global routing table relatively small because the space is so huge. So once you get oh, your global unicast address prefix, what you are going to work with is between the allocated prefix and the interface identifier. And behind me, you can see a small graphics which explains it. The global routing prefix is usually either equal slash 48 or is shorter. So anything between that number and slash 64, that's where you create your addressing plan. And the important message again is just let go of conservation mindset. The space is really huge, even though you might also see if you search really properly on the internet arguments that the space is actually not as huge. But uh, I think for now, we definitely can say that we can be comfortable, stretch, and just uh, create the right thing. So how do you go about the addressing plan? So first, again, emphasizing the hierarchy and the way you think about it is really going to then help you with the troubleshooting and operations. And it's absolutely essential. You want to make it as easy as possible for your help desk staff, for your engineers who are on call, even for designs and deployments. You really want to keep it as simple as possible, while obviously catering for all the business needs that your company has. Um, then also, some people are using, are using different automation tools, so then integration with IPAM you can actually easily pull the prefixes um, and you express them in intent and that can be automatically deployed. Some people are using Ansible, different tools to, to do this, you know, and that avoids the human error, which is so easy to do. How many times have you written a typo in a V4 address? In V6, you are guaranteed almost every time you do that, right? Um, so cookie cutter approach, templates, and think in terms of subnets. It's not about the hosts. The good thing is, while well, people say, oh, we want to save here, this is too much, it's too big, you know, we don't have maybe that many buildings uh, in different locations. The good thing is keep it the same across the different locations, different regions. Again, I keep repeating, is the cookie cutter approach. And uh, uh, for example, we would have um, in our largest campus to be over 100 buildings, but then would be campuses with only five. So it is your choice if you want to go maybe some, you know, the size of campus, small, medium, large. But again, that might be way too complicated. Keep it simple and just uh, do the same thing everywhere. It's going to pay back in a really good way. In terms of aggregation and your security policies, think where are you announcing to the internet? So those are your points where, are, where you want to aggregate. Obviously, you are aggregating somewhere inside the network. But remember, again, the longest prefix you can announce to the internet is slash 48. So think about those points. Where are your internet edges? What if you had to send um, some po portion of your traffic out on the internet because you deployed the services all of a sudden in cloud? They are not on-prem. They are sitting in a cloud. What can be there? Um, Nibble specific, I'll talk about it in a minute. And again, do you want to really expose information about your network? Some, um, some way of encoding the information is good, I would say, but the practices again differ. I would say this is good in, and used in smaller deployments, but when it comes to global enterprises, you just go by the hierarchy. 
You really don't want to have like a meta document which explains all the different ways the information is encoded. You want to have an architecture standard which explains how things are done at the different levels of the hierarchy. And I will show you an example of it on the next slide. And then you might want to say like for the infrastructure devices, we want to put, let's say, FF character somewhere in the middle of the interface identifier because you are choosing what is the interface identifier. You're assigning in a particular way. You're not using the automatic assignment. But the thing is like really don't overdo it. Um, it's useful for accounting and administrative purposes. Just again, keep in mind, space is huge. Keep it simple. And if it happens, which is going to happen, I can almost guarantee you are going to iterate, you know. So while you might have uh, the best intentions that you want to have the perfect addressing plan to start with, you will iterate. The important thing is with an addressing plan, keep a reserve for the growth, for the deployment of new segments, for the changes, the mergers and acquisitions, and just accept the iteration is part of making this really good. And it's a normal thing. Like where I was, we have been actually, I worked on the third iteration of the addressing architecture. And it still worked just fine. We have just uh, kind of cleaned up a little bit because the deployment of V6 has grown in, uh, globally and we wanted to uh, introduce more network segments. Again, this can be actually automated and IPv6 lends itself to readdressing, especially on the end user segments. Then it's more manual and labor intensive when it comes to the network infrastructure and network service devices, etc. But everything can be done in a quite feasible way. Here is a little bit on the nibble boundary. Nibble is that single character, as you can see behind me, four bits. It's a term which is used. Uh, the good thing about it is that it keeps the addressing plan quite readable and uh, tidy. You don't have to stick to it, and I will show you on the next slide something that immediately is going to break this. But uh, when you come to the levels, uh, um, you know, below the initial allocation or be below the initial assignment, it's good to keep that uh, nibble boundary rule in your mind. And you can also then um, filter and you know, uh, enforce your security policies on a particular nibble. And here is an example. I recognize that not everybody comes from a global multinational company and not everybody is going to have a slash 32. You might have multiple slash 48s. You might request um, slash 44, so you've got a little bit of space there. But this is more about the thought process that you can put into it and how you can think about it. And uh, for example, the split, and this is breaking the nibble rule, but it works really well, um, you know, visually, if you've got an IPAM and your addressing plan, that you see the portion of your top level prefix, the slash 32, you see it like one half is given to the corporate, the other is given to all the internet uh, customer facing uh, services. Um, I have seen it with the corp global corporates, I have seen it with large ISPs where basically they take a portion of the, of the top level allocation and they use one portion for the business services, so the revenue generating services, and the second portion for the, for the internal corpnet um, devices and users. And then you can basically go, this is really a thought process, this is not a standard anything, this is just to give you an inspiration. And you will hear from uh, people in the afternoon when they talk about their deployments, how they went about creating their addressing plan. But this, you can see then from the slash 40, I'm keeping kind of the, the nibble boundary, but there is, you could go even more granular, you know? Just think about it, is it worth it? Is it like, what is the easiest way how you can split the prefix that supports the operations and the deployments and your business? So in some companies, there is a trend of zero trust where they are deploying network segments on the, what used to be a corporate network. So they are trying to basically separate the traffic, the users, the devices for security reasons. And then they go and create various network segments. Within that, uh, the, the first slash 48, the good practice that I have seen was that the first slash 48 is always dedicated, to, dedicated for the infrastructure addressing, which then supports that uh, specific segments, you know. And then um, you can go obviously to the building level and uh, usually people standardize within their architectures, uh, you know, like loopbacks, point-to-point interfaces, um, multi-access LANs, and uh, for EBGP peering, et cetera, you know. So this is just an idea and you can actually see it's, it's about how you think about it. The space might look huge, 
but you need to think about it conceptually, and then you can use um, IPv6 subnet calculator to help you to work out the numbers or your IPAM, you know. That's not really that difficult. On the DC cloud side, typically what the deployment is, unless you are the cloud provider here in the room, you know, then uh, you probably have it for your cloud regions uh, differently, larger allocations. But for enterprise, typically we are looking at slash 48 per uh, DC, and then you, it's up to you how you create a structure, but the um, top of rack switches, which are the layer three boundary in your data center, they are then serving to the service, the containers, uh, uh, the VMs, they are serving slash 64. Few words on the infrastructures uh, addressing. Um, in general, there actually, there's an RFC which kind of governs it. It's already a few years out there, but it's, there haven't been any changes. This works really. The current recommendation is for the point-to-point -point links to um, prevent the neighbor discovery exhaustion attacks is to use slash 127. However, if you come to an existing IPv6 deployment has been around for a while, you know, and they are using devices that um, might, are, might be approaching the end of the life cycle, um, then uh, you might come across slash 126 because 127 wasn't supported. But honestly, it really doesn't matter. People even decide to keep it because, you know, it was there before, even with the new devices that support 127, we can do that, you know. Usually what is done is that you take a slash 64 for your loop, for your point to points, and you allocate a slash 127, you know, um, and or the 112 for the multi-access. That's really up to you how you configure it. Or it can be, and I've seen that too, that people take a slash 64 and allocate it per single infrastructure link. And then you are maybe eating a little bit faster through your uh, slash 64s, but uh, it's really a choice that you can make. For the loopbacks in the addressing plan, slash 64, but configure is 128. That's it, it's really not that difficult. The thing to remember, there was a thing few years ago, I'm not sure it was the situation now with the latest hardware and the network devices, but you need to check the specification of the vendor, how many longest prefix matches those devices can carry. Because it's different if you go slash 64s, and there's a different num uh, amount of TCAM that you need to have to store 128. Okay, so you need to check the documentation because there could be, oh, this device can hold um, tens or hundreds of thousands of IPv6, but if you are uh, publishing lots of loopbacks, you know, for your routing protocols in the network, then you basically uh, might actually hit a limit, especially on lower power devices. So I'm getting to an end, and uh, this is the final part of my talk. And uh, for the IP address management with IPv6, please, definitely let go of Excel spreadsheets. Especially if stored on someone's desktop under the, you know, under the desk or sitting on someone's dev server somewhere in a data center. It's a powerful tool, Excel, especially in Office 365, but don't use it for managing your IPv6 address space. It doesn't work. Because with the modern IPAMs, you can do a lot. You can really do a really good integration with your network orchestration, as I said, like people. You can reserve the prefixes in advance before your deployment, so nobody is going to take it away from you, and then you just basically deploy it. Um, it can manage so much more than just the IPv6 addresses, you know, prefixes, the quotas, the PTRs, and host resource uh, records. So. They are super smart, these systems, and it's worth investing. They are not the easiest to pick up. I have seen some. Uh, then, uh, the, I'm not recommending anyone here, but just definitely when you are thinking about it, if you don't have IPAM, please, it's time to do that. Now on the EULA question, right? Uh, because everybody asks about it, especially in the enterprise space, you know, because they would like to have this private addresses because that gives us some security in IPv6. You know, we have this RFC 19 v 4 Can we have the same thing? And you can translate between EULA and onto a global prefix. There is MPTV6. It's there, you know, it just swaps the prefixes. That's it. But then you don't have really the application gateway. So it's not as, as simple as one thing. The bigger problem is not the translation. But if you deploy on a dual stack network, EULAs, they will never be used by the devices that connect to the network. Because despite the standard that defines EULAs, the way the implementation is done in operating systems, it has the lowest priority, even before, below IPv4 the private. So if you do monitoring of your IPv6 deployment, which you always should do, 
you realize that your hard work that you put there with all the EULAs and stuff like that, there's no V6 traffic on your network. It's simple as that. And that is actually now being uh, expressed in an, uh, um, now it's a draft with IETF that was um, launched last year, I think summer last year, but it's actively being worked on, so you can expect this to be uh, um, RFC in the future. And it's talking about these unintended operational issues. So it's a nice thing, you know, you, you think about it, but when nobody uses your V6, like what is the point? Why have we done the work? On the V6 only, I would say, just go and do it if you want, right? Usually it should work for the infrastructure management, V6 only, okay? On your point-to-point -point links for LT. The question is whether your management system can speak to those devices on IPv6 only, right? Because EULA is used within an administrative domain, you know? On your internet edges, your ISP is never gonna accept any advertisements there, so that doesn't go anywhere. Because with the network devices, you have three planes. You've got the control plane, data plane, and the management plane. While the first two are quite well supported these days, especially in hardware, the management of devices, and Tom had his own experience with that in, in data centers, uh, like they don't always are able to manage over IPv6. And on IoT, when it comes to it, Graham, he's going to talk about it. He's the expert. The interesting thing is, and I really want to say like, thanks to Nico here, because I didn't know, I found out at the weekend, I was looking for this Sixes um, Sunsetted register, and then I found that your company has revived the um, EULA registry. So this is voluntary, this is not managed by any RIR, uh, but if you want to use EULA, and if you look at the over 5,500 prefixes, I think, registered right now, just to make sure that you are not going to use some uh, a prefix, EULA prefix, because that's set to 40 and the RFC, 40 bits, the RFC specifies the algorithm, how you generate it. Um, so you can actually go and just put it out there voluntarily that you are using the specific prefix, you know. So it is used somewhere by somebody, but in general for dual stack deployment, we've got the end user devices not recommended, okay. And I think Tom, you already mentioned, he talked about the IPv6 address assignment. I would say the biggest problem in general from enterprise perspective is that the DHCP v6 is not supported by Android. Even though at the latest IETF meeting, I heard from guys they are actually starting to think about DHCP v6 prefix delegation for some reasons. But right now, enterprises usually go and choose the DHCP v6 because you want to have kind of the traceability of the users on your network. That is really the main reasons. Um, with the stateless address auto configuration, the RDNSS works really well. I have run it V6 only pilot, and we were using uh, stateless address auto configuration with RDNSS. Just worked fine. You know, Windows added the support like in 2018 or 2017, I think, probably 2017, more like that, yeah. So it works, you know, that is supported on all the devices. And when it comes to the manual, that is usually left to devices where you need to have stable address, you know, so it's not changing temporarily, like the temporary and privacy addressing. Um, that's usually left for infrastructure and server deployments uh, where you need to have static permanent address. So with that, that was a really quick fly through how you go about create your, uh, creating your addressing plan. Now the question to you is, do you have questions? Nico. So uh, first of all, thanks a lot for the intro. I mean, a lot of things, obviously, I know, but I, I really like to get a grasp again, like how you actually separate your networks. Um, maybe if you can head back to the slide where you had the split of the 32 in regards to addressing. Yes, that one. So I want to point out that I really like this way how you, you suggest there. We've seen a lot of deployments where people just take random 48s from the infrastructure, and that works fine until you want to actually aggregate. So thinking a little bit about like how you actually separate your networks, I want to add this here. In the beginning, mm. you will probably like, likely get it wrong, mm -hmm. and then reiterate later better. So I, I really like this as a starting point. Um, Thank you. Yeah, just wanted to say that. Yeah, I would say like usually the way, now there's so much more information, so much more experience. I'm going to put in the PDF a few references for you, uh, some books, you know, and good documents because people have published documents. 
However, it's normal to start in some way, and then uh, when you iterate again and you go further with your deployment, it's good to clean up, you know, and just do the, th the right thing, which then uh, further helps your deployment, you know, instead of inhibits. Uh, one last comment to the uh, EULA, if you can, don't use it. <laughs> Always go for the global stuff, it's much more fun. Thank you, Nico. I actually had an interesting conversation with someone recently about uh, an infrastructure slash 48 that they were using for numbering VRF0, and they, they only had a, a slash 29 from RIPE. Only. And they didn't want to break into that for a single slash 48, so they went and asked RIPE for a, an IPv6 PI assignment. And RIPE said, no, you've got lots of IPv6. But the point was, they wanted to number this on VRF0, and they didn't want it announced to the internet. Mm -hmm. That's actually a really valid use case. Yeah. It's actually, you've got to think about that sometimes. There's so much more to do than with V4, you know. Well, there any thank you very much. I would say, if there are more questions, sorry, Tom, uh, unless there is. Oh, sorry, Tim. So just, just a couple. First of all, in, in that one there, would you also have a layer for, for separating out production and test environments? Yeah, you could definitely do that. You could do it in that network yeah. segment. Okay, yeah. Or if you have a large allocation like slash 29, you could then go to like multiple slash 32s and dedicate that. And the other one is, um, how do you distinguish between a control player and a manage management layer? I've never heard that distinction. Control plane, data plane, and management plane. I'm, I'm familiar with the control plane and data plane, but I've never heard of a management plane as a separate thing. Yeah, there's the, all the protocols, SNMP, um, FTP, I don't okay. do it, but all those protocols that you use to connect your devices uh, to manage them. Uh, I will put that in the control plane. Was, is there a management plane? Uh, we usually separate it as a management plane because usually there was no V6. Yeah, okay, fine, fine. thank you. And we had to go and beat up the vendors that we need to manage the devices on IPv6 only. There's Joe there. And that's the last, just last question because I don't want to eat into time for Tim. Hello, thanks very much. It's more a comment because uh, it's really important that we do separate this control data and management plane because all of those things need to be supported with IPv6. My friend and I, Kamal here, we work for a vendor and we very much want you to push vendors and push them hard because we can't do anything to push our feature set to move forward with IPv6 unless you come forward and say, we really want IPv6 and we want it for all of these features. So saying things like, we want parity with V4 and V6, that's not good enough. Mm. We really need you to push hard for the things that you're actually going to use. So things like, right, we want a management plane that's IPv6 only, as well as the fact that we've got like RIP V2 on there that we can tick a box against. That's the kind of considerations that you need to be thinking about. Thank you so much. Sorry, it wasn't a question. Well, it's a really good comment. Really appreciate it because people think that vendors are doing charity. They are not, you know, unless you, it's the money behind that they're not going to do it. Anyway, I thank you so much for your attention. And I would like to invite Tim to talk about applications on IPv6. Thank you.